God is good. God is good. Well, go ahead and grab hands with the people around you, a person next to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great grace. We thank you, Father, that your grace is sufficient for us. We thank you, Father, for all the goodness that you've made available to us, not requiring anything on our part. We didn't have to do anything. You're just a good God. You are love. You're a loving God. So we're grateful. We take this moment to acknowledge your goodness. We take this moment to acknowledge your grace, your graciousness. We take this moment to acknowledge you for your love and affection. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lord. We're grateful. We're grateful to be here in this place. We're grateful that we have a place that we can come together as believers. Thank you, Father, for giving us this place. Thank you, Father, for your word open to us, revealed to us. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that's on the inside of every believer. Your spirit leads and guides us in all truth. Your spirit teaches us how to deal with wisely. Yes. Your spirit shows us things to come. Yes. Father, we have expectation for your word. We have expectation yes. to hear from you. Yes. Father, we have expectation to receive your word in seed form. Yes. We have greater expectation that that seed, the seed of your word, produces a harvest in our lives, a harvest in our character. And we're grateful, Father. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We are believers. Yes. We are the redeemed. Yes, yes Lord. My goodness, glory to you. We welcome your presence, welcome your spirit in this place. Glory to God. If you believe that, go ahead and shout amen. amen. Hug somebody next to you. Let them know that you're excited about them being here. And then you may be seated. Amen. God is good. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. I would ask you if God has been good to you, but I already know the answer to that question. Amen. God's been good to me, too. <laughs> Prior to me coming here, I came over straight from... Um, Ballet practice. <laughs> McKenzie's ballet practice. <laughs> Amen. Hey, so I was sitting in ballet practice. She wanted me to watch. And I was taking notes for the message tonight. So if you get something out of it, if it's good to you, be sure to thank McKenzie out in the foyer. Amen. Amen. We're entering a new um, message series titled Think Rich, Live Wealthy. You know, this is the year of stability. Anybody excited about that? Yes. yes. And um, what we believe is, you know, that's not just something that we've named the year, but it's what God is speaking to us, or what God has spoken to us. It's what God wants to do in our lives. Um, bring us to a place of stability where we, we are not tossed to and fro, um, but we are stable. We have resolve. We have conviction. We're grounded. We're rooted in firm beliefs. Beliefs. So as, as life happens, as things happen, as society changes, we're not moved, right? Amen. As we experience challenges, we're not moved, but we're rooted in what God has said. That's what he's doing to us. And so he's, as we've, you know, journeyed into this year, that's what we've been talking about. And he's given us word about stability in our relationships, right? And now, you know, you, you can't leave out finances. Amen. God wants us stable in every area of our lives, including our finances. Amen. 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 And it's about time, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's about time. So, you know, I know you've probably heard many preachers say this before, but I'm going to go ahead and say it because I believe it. I think this is the most important message I've ever taught. <laughs> You're ready to receive it. Yeah. Amen. All right. This is Wednesday night Bible study, right? Yes, it is. So we're going to go through some text. Amen. 
I know some of y'all come here on Wednesday night, you get the opportunity to get your, 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 I don't know if it's your monthly reading, your weekly reading, whatever it is, but I'm gonna make sure that you get some scripture in this year, amen. You can check that off of your resolution list. I read the Bible this year. You ready? I'm gonna help you, I'm here to help you out. So um, the title of the message uh, for tonight is Draw from Jesus. Go ahead and say that. Draw from Jesus. Draw from Jesus. Pull from Jesus. Draw from Jesus. Like making a withdrawal. We're drawing from Jesus. Okay? And uh, we'll see that his portion, what is his portion, is our distribution. His portion, our distribution. We'll talk about that more later. I want you to get that in your mouth. His portion, His portion. Our, distribution. our distribution. That's good news. You ain't shouting about it right now, but I believe by the end of it, you'll have something to shout about. Amen. His portion is our distribution. We're going to look at a very familiar account in the Bible, one that you've heard of many, many times, and you've probably heard many messages from it. Um, but I believe that tonight we'll see it in a different way. Okay. Um, you know the account. There's, a, there's, you know, you've heard it many times where Jesus fed the multitude. Jesus fed the 5,000, right? Y'all heard about that one? Yeah. And two fish and five loaves fed all of them people. That's what we're going to talk about today. And I know that you've heard it before. And some of you heard it so many times that you think you know everything there is to know about it. But I want you to open your ears up so that you hear, Okay. I believe you hear something new. His portion, our distribution. We know part of that, that, um, that account simply says this. You know, it says, Jesus looked up into heaven. He gave thanks unto God. He broke the bread in pieces. He then gave it to his disciples, who in turn gave it to the crowds. And everyone ate until they were satisfied. They picked up the leftovers and filled up 12 baskets full. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Mark chapter 8 or tap, tap it, touch screen it, whatever it is that you do. Look up here on the screen, they'll have it. Mark chapter 8, I'm going to read from the uh, Passion Translation. Mark chapter 8, starting at verse number 17. It says this, it says, Knowing what they were thinking, Jesus said to them, why all this fussing over forgetting to bring bread? This is Jesus talking to his disciples, right? This is taking place shortly after Jesus feeds the 4,000. Y'all know there are two different accounts, right? One time Jesus fed 5,000, another he fed 4,000. So this is shortly after he feeds the 4,000. Jesus says, knowing what they were thinking, Jesus said to them, why all this fussing over forgetting to bring bread? Do you still not see or understand what I say to you? Are your hearts still hard? You've, you have good eyes, yet you still don't see. And you have good ears, yet you still don't hear. Neither do you remember. When I multiplied the bread to feed more than 5,000 people, how many baskets full of leftovers did you gather afterward? Twelve, they replied. And when I multiplied food to feed over 4,000, how many large baskets full of leftovers did you gather afterwards? Seven, they replied. Then how is it that you still don't Get it. One of the translations says that he repeated this question over and over again. How is it? I mean, you can picture him. He's, he's like, how? You know, you ever have somebody look at you like, what you mean? How don't you? Husbands, wives, your spouse looked at you like, how you don't get it? You know, after all the times that I've told you to not leave the socks on the floor, how don't you still? What's going on? You know, so Jesus is asking this question over and over. I mean, he's really, his mind is like, how don't you get it? I mean, you saw me feed 5,000. After the 5,000 were fed, you picked up 12 baskets of what was left over. 
And then you just saw me feed 4,000. And after the 4,000 were fed, you picked up seven large baskets left over. How is it that you still don't get it? Right? Jesus, in these two accounts, Jesus gives us a perfect picture of God's kingdom in operation. Can I have some tissue? I'm going to say that again. Jesus gives us a perfect picture of God's kingdom in operation. The feeding of the 5,000. Thank you. I'm going to keep the box. The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000 is a perfect picture of the kingdom of God in operation. I'm going to say that again because I think it's battling against what you think you already know about what happened right there and you ain't really hearing it, right? The feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, gives us a perfect demonstration of God's kingdom in operation. Okay? So we thought the meaning of the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, we thought that it was all about a miracle. We thought the point was a miracle. We thought the point was Jesus took a little bit and made a lot. And for all these years, that's just about all we've gotten out of it, right? And we've, we've pulled encouragement from the account, believing that even if I have a little bit, Jesus can take my little bit and stretch it out to a lot. And that's about as, most, that's as, as much as we've gotten from those accounts, right? Jesus is a miracle worker. Jesus can perform a miracle. If I don't have enough, he'll make it enough. He's a miracle worker. And since that's all we've heard and that's all we've understood from this account, that's about all we've done with it is expect a miracle. And years have passed and the most that we've gotten out of this is a bunch of church people expecting miracles. We expect money miracles. We expect Jesus to do what only he can do. And there are things that uh, he did the miracle. And he is a miracle worker. But what he's saying is that that is not the point. That's not the point. And we know the scripture. We know the scripture. We know the just shall live by not miracles. The expectation is not for us to live from one miracle to the next miracle. So many church people, their whole hope and expectation is built off the last miracle they got. And, it's, and, and I'm not downplaying miracles, but we just need to get this right. Or we'll be left in the same position as the people in these accounts. In Matthew 6, you know Matthew 6, 33? You know what it says? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. God. God has a kingdom because God is a king. Every king has a kingdom. Well, what is the king's kingdom? The kingdom is the place that the king has dominion or rule or authority. So we're encouraged to, we are encouraged to seek first his God's what? kingdom, but break it down so it makes sense to us, because we don't use words like kingdom every day. We don't know nothing about that. So what is that? Let's unpack it. What does it mean? We're, we're encouraged to seek first God's rule. So the first thing that I should seek is God's rule over my life. In seeking his kingdom, I'm seeking him as a king, and I'm giving him rulership over me. Dominion over me, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek first God's rulership, God's dominion over your life. And then what does it say next? And seek his righteousness. 
What is righteousness? We know it's right standing with God, but it's, it's this right way of doing things. Every kingdom has a way. Every king has a way. Every king has a way of doing things. We don't call him the king. We don't call, we have a government, we have a president, but our government, our president, the leader that's in, in that seat has a way of doing things. Every nation, everywhere you go, right? I like to talk about the nation of Jordan. Jordan has a king, right? Um, king Ab Abdullah, am I right? And he has a way of doing things. And his way of doing things is reflected in the kingdom. If you go to the kingdom and you see how the kingdom operates and you see how the people govern themselves and you see the, the, the progress that's, that's being made there, it's a reflection of the king. So we're told to seek ye first, seek first God's, the king's rulership over us, his dominion, and then seek his right way of doing things. Because as a citizen of this kingdom, if I'm a citizen of his kingdom, if I'm a citizen in the place where the king has dominion, then there has to be a way that I govern myself in his kingdom. Amen or in his community. If I'm in his community, then in his community, I have to govern myself a certain way. I have to live a certain way. There's a right way for me to live in his community. Right? Just like any other community. My wife and I used to live in a deep, restricted community. There was a way in that community. There was a way to do things. Right? You couldn't do what you wanted to do. Yeah, it's your house, but you ain't painting this house pink. It's not the way of this community. Every community has a way. God's community has a way. We're encouraged to seek first his rulership over our lives and then seek his way of doing things. And then all these things shall be added unto you. You see that? So I want that to be in your your you're thinking as we go through this. I'm going to go ahead and, um, so I don't get too excited and, and forget to do this, I'm going to give you the main points at the beginning. Amen. That way you won't miss them. Or some of you have had a long day and you might start nodding off. So I'm going to give them to you now while you're excited still. You ready? Yeah. Point one, you'll see provision when you seek to meet other people's need. Amen. Yes. You'll see provision when you seek to meet other people's need. Because we'll see that that is a way of God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, in God's community, people are priority. So as a citizen in his kingdom, I will see provision as I put the priority of the king as my priority. You'll see provision when you seek to meet other people's need. What you have, oh, y'all ready for this? Y'all wrote that one down? Yeah. I'm about to say something. I don't want you to miss it. You know how you have that person always asking, what'd he say, what'd he say? <laughs> I can't hear what he's saying because you talking. So here it comes. You ready? What you have in yourself as a citizen in God's community, as a citizen in God's kingdom, what you have in yourself will never be enough. Right. What you have in yourself will never be enough. Listen, you will never have enough to provide for the budget of the kingdom That's why the kingdom has a king to do that. You'll never have enough in yourself to provide for what the kingdom wants to do. But that's often how we approach things as if I have sufficiency in myself to provide for what God wants to do. And the truth is, if that were the case, then you wouldn't need a king. You'll never, you will never, I'll, you need to go ahead and say that. I feel some pushback on that one right there. So you need to go ahead and get that one in your mouth. Repeat after me. I will never, I will never have, enough have enough 
in myself to meet the need of the kingdom. You won't. You will never have enough to meet the king's, the kingdom's budget. All the kingdom wants to do, all that God is doing, you'll never have enough in yourself to meet the need or meet the budget of the kingdom. Which leads me to my second point. Draw from Jesus. That's why we are always in a position where we have to draw from Jesus. As a believer, you will never be in a place where you don't have to draw from Jesus. Because in yourself, you'll never have enough to meet the budget of the kingdom. So I'm drawing from Jesus. Man, I'm giving y'all y'all the answers. I'm giving you the answers up front. I'm giving you, I'm gonna give you the answers up front. We draw from Jesus. You draw from Jesus. Glory to God. What you have in yourself will never be enough. You'll never have enough to provide for a kingdom budget. That's why you draw from Jesus. Then, see, this, and this, this is where we get mixed up in it. You know, sometimes we think that we do have it sufficient in ourselves. Or what, this is what happens. What happens is God has an agenda. The kingdom has an agenda. People are a priority in the kingdom. People are first priority in God's kingdom. The kingdom always has an agenda. And what happens is we add to that agenda, or we have our own agenda, and we go out trying to accomplish our own agenda, and we come up short, and then we look to God, right? I remember some, and how do I know this? I know this because I did that. I did that. I was, you know, some time ago, I was, I messed some money up, jacked some money up, and I wanted to blame it on God, and I went to God talking and crying about it and everything, complaining, and he checked me real quick. He said, it's not my problem. <laughs> it's your problem. He says, my budget, he says, I'm never over budget and I'm never under budget. I have exactly what I need to do what I plan to do. You messed this up. And what he was telling me was, you got off of my agenda. You got off of my agenda. And here's the thing, here's the thing. The, the trouble that we get into is we're trying to I'm talking about church people, believers, but people in church. When you try to, you're trying to meet the needs of the kingdom and meet your need out of the same pot, and you'll never have enough. You'll end up running out of seed to sow or running out of bread to eat. You know the scripture in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I think it's about verse 11, verse 10, verse 11. Paul says, he gets the revelation, he tells us that God provides seed to the sower and bread for your eating, right? We have to grow to the place where we, dis we know the difference because you cannot sow and eat from the same plate. Yes. You'll end up eating your seed or giving your bread. You won't have enough. Right? All right. Let's look at um, Mark 6. Get into it now. Mark 6. I gave y'all all the answers up front. You got all the answers up front. All the answers up front. Mark 6, starting at verse number 30. I'm going to read from the Easy Reader version. You ready? Now, now the feeding of the 5,000, um, all four gospel writers wrote about that. All four gospel writers wrote about that. And um, some of them, you know, um, added, you know, different perspectives of it or maybe added some, some things that one of the other ones didn't say. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those things. But here's Mark's account of that situation. Starting at verse number 30, it says, the apostles Jesus had sent out came back to him. Remember, uh, some of you remember when Jesus sends out his disciples two by two, right? He's training them. They're in like ministry school, right? He gets his disciples. He's teaching them how to 
witness, how to evangelize. He gets them and he sends them out two by two to go out and evangelize, right? So they've come back. They've come back. That's what's happening right now. The, the, the apostles, the disciples coming back to Jesus to give a report of what happened when they were out there. Something else that is happening at this same time is John the Baptist has just been killed. OK, John the Baptist has just been killed. <clears throat> John the Baptist's disciples go and get his body from 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 the um, prison, his headless body from the prison. Right. Jesus just hears about that. So Jesus just hears about John the Baptist being killed. His disciples that he sent out are come, have come back and they're giving a report of their experience. And it says they gathered around him and told him about all they had done and taught. Jesus and his followers, his disciples, were in a very busy place. You see that in your mind? There were so many people that he had, that he and his followers did not even have time to eat. So he said to them, come with me. We will go to a quiet place to be alone. There we will get some rest. So you see what's on Jesus' mind. This is Jesus talking, right? Right? So here we get to see some of his human humanity, right? He just hears about John the Baptist, his cousin, right? John the Baptist has just been killed. He's been ministering all day. His disciples have been out ministering all day. They come back. Jesus says, it's too many people around here. I'm tired. Y'all tired. I'm hungry. You're hungry. Let's go somewhere where we can be alone, have some quiet time, get some rest. That's what's on Jesus' mind. Verse 32 says, so Jesus and his disciples and his followers went away alone. They went in a boat to a place where no one lived. They found themselves a nice secluded area. But many people saw them leave and knew who they were. So people from every town ran to the place where they were going and got there before Jesus. Quiet time over. <laughs> Quiet time over. As Jesus stepped out of the boat, he saw a large crowd waiting. Now get the heart of Jesus. Get the heart of Jesus. Right here, you're going to see the priority of the kingdom. Jesus, I'm tired. I'm hungry. He gets off the boat. He sees a crowd of people. He felt sorry for them because they were like, what? Sheep without a shepherd to care for them. So he taught the people many things. It was now very late in the day. He's been teaching them all day. It's now very late in the day. Jesus' followers came to him and said, no one lives around here, and it is already very late, so send the people away. They need to go to the farms and towns around here to buy some food to eat. You see what's happening? They've been in conference all day. Y'all know if you've been to conference before, you know how the conference can go, man. In the conference, you're ready to find some food. We're tired. These people tired. Let's let him go, Jesus. But Jesus sees a need, right? Jesus, he's going to get a vacation, going to get some rest, but he sees a need. This is something that you got to understand. Where there is no need, there is no miracle. Where there is no need, there is no miracle. I want you to, we're going to shift our thinking, shift our position. If you want to see a miracle, find the need. If you want to see a miracle, find the need. Where there is no need, there is no miracle. Look at verse 37. So his disciples came. Let's send these people away, right? Jesus says, well, I got to talk about that some more because uh, his disciples were ready to send the people away, you know? And I don't know, I, you know, I don't want to, throw nobody under the bus. I don't know those guys except for what we read, you know. I don't know what they're really thinking. I don't know if they're saying, you know what, I'm tired. I'm hungry. These people need to get, get gone <laughs> so we can eat. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I just imagine they people just like we people. And if I was there with Jesus, I probably would have been thinking the same thing. Let these people go on somewhere so we can get some rest. Verse 37, but Jesus answered, 
You give them some food to eat. See, where there is no need, there is no miracle. And our responsibility as disciples, followers of Jesus, citizens of the kingdom, is to identify the need. Don't dismiss the need. Where there is no need, there is no miracle. Jesus says, you give them some food to eat. They said to Jesus, we can't buy enough bread to feed all these people. We would ha all have to work a month to earn enough to buy that much bread. Jesus asked them, how many loaves of bread do you have now? Go and see. They counted their loaves of bread. They came to Jesus and said, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. We have five loaves and two fish. There's a lot in there, and we'll talk about it, but something I want to point out right now is never overlook what you do have. Sometimes we can have such a scarcity mentality that you don't even see what you do have. Notice Jesus told them to go and do inventory. I mean, come on now. They know, they are, they know what they have. They know they ain't got enough for all these people. But Jesus tells them, go and see what you do have. And that's a note to us. What do we have to say? What am I saying to us? What is he saying to us? Always take note of what you do have. Because there's significance in what you do have. There's significance in what you do have. Remember, there was a lady, a widow lady, who had a son. All she had was some sticks she had picked up, a handful of meal, and a few drops of oil. And she went to the prophet. The prophet came to her and she said to the prophet, this is all I have. And basically the prophet said, that is enough. And it turned out to be more than enough. Right? You can't get stuck with a scarcity mentality, thinking that you don't have enough. Oftentimes you miss what you have because you're always looking Look behind, beyond what you, what you got something. And guess what? Jesus knows what you got. Jesus knows what you have. I remember I was praying about these things and praying about, you know, just understanding, you know, prosperity and everything and praying for some people. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit told me, all these people praying for money and praying for prosperity. And he says, I gave them all jobs. <laughs> All of them got jobs. They praying for increase and praying for all of this stuff, and I gave them all jobs. Don't overlook what you do have. What you have is significant. Moses didn't think he had enough. Moses got them words from, from God, from the burning bush, from God. God told him that he was going to deliver the people from, from Egypt. Moses was like, how? With what? God said, what do you have? A rod. Well, with that rod, you're going to deliver these people from Egypt. And God performed miracles with what Moses had. Don't overlook what you have. Some of you need to go home tonight and take inventory of what you do have. Mm. We'll talk about that some more. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about it right now. So... <laughs> So there are some people, there are some people for, for years and years, people were saying, as they described the creation, people would say that God, they, they, there's this term, they would say ex nihilo, which meant out of nothing. God created everything out of nothing, right? But I heard, I think Pastor Dollar, somebody else might have said it, but I know Pastor Dollar said it, this, that's not, not that's actually true. What, the way that we should see it is that God made the material world out of the immaterial. So he did use something. It just was not material. God took immaterial and made material. And then he gave material to man and said, you use this material seed to create more material. Because that's how you're going to function in this material realm, in this earth, in this physical realm. God took immaterial and made material. And he gave seed to man, mankind, gave seed to mankind to continue to create. So never overlook what you do have. 
if you notice that what you do have is not enough to meet the need of the kingdom, then what you have is seed. What you have is seed. Never overlook or forsake the potential of seed. Do we got to talk about that? Yes. We do? Do you want to talk about the potential of a seed? How much potential is in a seed? Everything that we see today came from seed. Everybody in this room, everybody watching online is the product of seed. There are people who estimate that since the first man, from 80 to 100 billion people have lived on the planet. 80 billion to 100 billion people. All 80 to 100 billion people are product of a seed. The seed is always smaller than the harvest. So don't get so thrown off as you look for the expected harvest. Don't, don't overlook a small seed because every seed is smaller than the harvest. All of us in here have something. God has given us something. God has given us something. Oh, goodness. What you have now is never enough for what he needs. So he multiplies what we have. He multiplies what we have. And what we see happening is his super plus our natural. His super plus our natural produces more than enough. Look at verse 39. It says, Then Jesus said to them, Tell everyone to sit in groups on the green grass. So all the people sat in groups. There are about 50 or 100 people in each group. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up to the sky and thanked God for the food. Then he broke the bread into pieces, which he gave to his who? He broke the pieces and gave to his followers, gave to his disciples to distribute to the people. Then he divided the two fish among everyone there. They all ate until they were full. After they were finished eating, the followers filled 12 baskets with pieces of bread and fish that were left. There were about 5,000 men, 5,000 families there who ate. The same account is talked about in John chapter 6. Y'all can go there. John chapter 6. I want to start at verse 1. John chapter 6. I'm going to speed up a little bit. You ready? John chapter 6, starting at verse 1. I'm going to read from the easy reader version. It says, Later Jesus went across Lake Galilee, also known as Lake Tiberias. A great crowd of people followed him because they saw what? The miraculous signs he did in healing the sick. Why were they following him? Because they saw the miracle. The crowd followed Jesus because of the signs, because of miracles. Why do you follow? Why do you follow Jesus? There are three distinct groups here. In each account, in the feeding of the 5,000, in the feeding of the 4,000, there are three distinct groups. There are the the disciples. You know, the Pharisee is always around. (laughs) And there's the crowd. The disciples, the followers of Jesus, the Pharisees, and the crowd. Which group are you in? Which group are you in? And I just got to insert this right here. I heard a wise man say, believers have signs following, but make believers follow signs. Believers have signs following, make believers follow signs. And this is, this is where we got to switch our position See, for so long, there's so many of us who came to Jesus in need. We came to Jesus wanting, and there's nothing wrong with coming to Jesus wanting. But when he supplies you, you have to switch position. You're given the opportunity to switch position. At some point, you should no longer be the person that's always looking to receive. When are you going to become the person that is providing? There's a difference in in the people who stood before Jesus in these accounts. There are the disciples, there are the religious people, the Pharisees, and then there's the crowd. 
And I'm saying that we need to, some people need to move from the crowd and move into disciple position. Notice the difference. Notice the difference. Well, notice the difference. Notice where Jesus was wanting to get, Jesus wanted, Jesus wanted to make a distinction between the disciples and the crowd. In, in verse 3, it says, or did I skip something? Let's see. Ah, uh, so the people are following Jesus because of the signs, because of the miracles, right? Um, even after he feeds them, they continue to follow him because he fed them. In John chapter 6, around verse 25 and 26, um, it, says, it says, when they found him back across the sea, this is after he already fed them, they said to him, Rabbi, how did you get over here? Because that's when Jesus walked on the sea. Right? They, you know, like, come on. Jesus is like, you know, Jesus is like real straight. He says, man, come on. Let's cut through the um, crap. I can say crap in church. <laughs> he said, cut through the crap. You've come looking for me not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you. Amen. You've come looking for me not because, not because you saw God in me, but you came because of the miracle. You come because of the sign. You filled your stomachs for free is what the message Bible says. That's why you are following me. And even after Jesus gives it to them straight, they still didn't get it. They still continue to ask for signs. They still continue to ask for miracles. And listen, if you consider yourself a disciple, you should never be in a position where you're asking for a miracle. I'll take that one clap. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You shouldn't be looking for the miracle. <laughs> the point of the miraculous event of feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000 wasn't so people look for miracles. The reason that Jesus did the miraculous thing in your life that he did wasn't so that you keep looking for miracles. And that's what happens. That's why people have these long, I mean, it's been 20 years. 20 years ago, he did that miracle. And you're still looking for the next miracle. And in between, all of this stuff in between is just mess. Less than kingdom. Because you like these people following Jesus for a miracle. And not understanding that that wasn't his point. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Wasn't the point. Amen. The point is not to look for miracles. Right, oh, glory. glory. <laughs> Go back to um, John 6, but back up to verse 3. All right, I'm going to speed up. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus went up on the side of the hill and sat there with his followers. It was almost the time for the Jewish Passover festival. Jesus looked up and saw a crowd of people coming toward him. He said to Philip, Philip is a leader. He says to the leader, and I feel like this is, he's speaking to leaders today. This is a message to leaders. He's asked the leader, he says, where can we buy enough bread for all these people to eat? He asked Philip this question to test him. This is a question to leaders. The question is coming from the leader to leaders, the disciples. In this case, he's specifically talking to Philip. But I believe he's talking to leaders even today. How have you responded to Jesus's question? Notice the question. The question assumes some things. There's some things that the question assumes. First, the question assumes that Jesus and the disciples are going to feed the people. He didn't ask are we going to feed the people? He assumes that that's already a done deal. You know we're feeding these people, right? Jesus isn't asking you whether or not you're going to meet somebody else's need. Jesus isn't asking you whether or not you're going to be a help or a benefit to somebody else. That's already assumed. You're a citizen of the kingdom. That's what we do. I ain't got to ask you about that. The next thing is that's assumed, he says, that Jesus and the disciples already have enough to buy the food. He assumes that you already got enough. Yes. The question Jesus is asking is not, will we feed them? It's not whether or not you got enough to feed them, because he already knows what you got. But what he asks is, where is the food going to come from? Oh, shoot. 
That's a good question. <laughs> this question is directly connected to the whole point of the event. Where is the food going to come from? Jesus says, where can we go to exchange our not enough for enough to provide these people? Jesus already knew what he planned to do, it says. Philip answered, we would all have to work a month to buy enough bread for each person here to have only a little piece. Another follower that was there, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, Andrew said, here's a boy with five loaves of barley bread and two little fish, but that is not enough for so many people. I think he was trying to be sarcastic because he knew that already. <laughs> right? right? Jesus asked, where can we go to get provision for these people? The disciples responded by looking to themselves. Jesus asked, where can we go to get Food to provide these people. The disciples looked to themselves and said, we don't have enough. That's always the answer. That's always the answer when you look to yourself. Whenever God asks you to do anything and you respond by looking at what you got, you'll always come to the same conclusion. I don't have enough. You'll always do less than what can be done when you base your decision on your limited supply. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We're going to get to the answer. Let's look at Mark chapter 8. My goodness. Mark chapter 8, starting at verse number 1. Reading from the Easy Reader version, it says, Another time, now this is when he feeds the 4,000. Fed the 5,000 feeding 4,000. Another time there were many people with Jesus. The people had nothing to eat. So he called his followers to him and said, I feel sorry for these people. They've been with me for three days and now they have nothing to eat. I should not send them home hungry. If they leave without eating, they will faint on the way home. Some of them live a long way from here. Notice again, Jesus wanted to do something for the people who spent time with him. Got to point that out, right? After spending all day with Jesus, Jesus is going to want to do something for you. All right. Jesus' followers answered, but we are far away from any towns. Where can we get it? Here it is again. Where can we get enough bread to feed all these people? Notice the disciples' I can't attitude, right? They got a scarcity mentality. But they've seen miracles. How many miracles do you need to see to get out of your humanity? How many miracles do you need to see to stop limiting yourself to the natural? Oh, goodness. Verse 5 says, then Jesus asked them, how many loaves of bread do you have? They answered, we have seven loaves. Jesus is like, yeah, I know, I, I know that. I know you ain't got enough, right? God, oh, we talked about that already. I want you to take notice of this. Take notice of what you have. Of what you have, you, what you have is always smaller than what he wants done, Right? What you have is always the seed. Seed is always smaller than the harvest. Look at verse 6. Jesus told the, told the people to sit on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and gave thanks to God. He broke the bread into pieces and he gave them to his followers. He told them to give the bread to the people and they did as he said. The followers also had a few small fish. Jesus gave thanks for the fish and told them to give the fish to the people. They all ate until they were full. Then the followers filled the seven baskets with pieces of food that were left. There were about 4,000 men who ate. After they ate, Jesus told them to go home. Then he went in a boat with his followers to the area of Dalmanutha. Skip down to verse 14. After this happens, look what happens. Oh, my goodness. The followers, the disciples, had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. They must have ate some, right? They had all this bread left. <laughs> they going somewhere else. They're going on another mission, and they only got one loaf of bread left. They forgot to bring more bread. There you go. Jesus warned them, be careful. Guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. Right before this happens, the Pharisees question Jesus. They question Jesus and they ask Jesus to perform a sign. He said, if you are, they, they went to Jesus and said, if you are who you say you are, then do a miracle. Right? right? That's what they said to Jesus, right? Jesus said, I ain't giving you no miracle. I'm, I'm not giving you no sign. All right, I'm not using a miracle to prove who I am. 
And if you always need a miracle to see who I am, <laughs> then you know what group you're in. <laughs> he says to his followers, be careful. Guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. The followers discussed the meaning of this. They said, he said this because we have no bread. Jesus knew that the followers were talking about this, so he asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are you not able to understand? Do you have eyes that can't see? Do you have ears that can't hear? Remember what I did before when you didn't have enough bread? I divided five loaves for 5,000 people. Remember how many baskets you filled with the pieces of food that were not eaten? The followers answered, we filled 12 baskets. And when I did seven loaves of bread for 4,000 people, how many baskets did you fill with the leftover pieces? We filled seven baskets. He says to them, you remember these things I did, but you still don't understand? He's saying, why is your provision still your top priority? When I've shown you time and time again, if you put the kingdom first, you'll receive what you need. When you make his priority your priority, you will always be able to draw from Jesus. And this is the meaning of the miracle. This is the kingdom of God in action. In John 16, 15, Jesus says, everything that the Father has, he's made it mine. And he says, that is what I mean when I said that the Holy Spirit will take the things that are mine and will reveal. I like what the Amplify says. The Amplify says it will declare, disclose, and transmit it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine, and the Holy Spirit will transmit those things from me that I got from the Father to you. Say, draw from Jesus. The Father is the source. The Father has given everything to the Son, who's the head of the church. The disciples, the church, say, I'm, the, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a disciple. I'm a, I'm a church. I'm a church. The disciples, the church, brings the material, the natural seed to the Son. The disciples brought what they had, which was not enough. Two fish, five loaves, not enough, but we're bringing what we have. We're bringing the material Amen. to the sun. Amen. The sun took the material thing, took the thing that was not enough, took the small thing, presented it to the Father, gave thanks for that thing that was not enough. And what was not enough is then multiplied. And the scripture says from then on, he distributed to his disciples. But he didn't give them back what he, they gave to him. He gave them back more than enough because he multiplies what's given. Oh, goodness. One of the translations say they distributed from his provision. That's what the church is supposed to do. We distribute from his provision. We're never asked to meet the need from our own supply. We distribute from his provision. He's got enough. He's more than enough. He's already been filled. He's the storehouse. He's the supply. I'm just drawing from Jesus to meet the needs of the people. Glory to God. The son blesses it and multiplied it back to them. He doesn't give them back what they gave. What was sown was not enough. What is reaped is more than enough. Don't expect to ever have enough in yourself to meet the budget of the kingdom. But you're expected to always draw from Jesus. Glory to God. Give God some praise. Stand on your feet. Hallelujah. Don't miss this point. <laughs> the place that we, we get thrown off is when we substitute the kingdom's priority for our priority. And you'll always come up short because you can't eat and sow from the same plate. We've got to make sure that our priority is the kingdom's priority because people are always first place. People are always first place. In, in, in Luke chapter 
I think it starts in Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 15, and Luke chapter 16. Jesus gives a series of parables, and all of them are to the same point. People are the priority. People are the priority. He gives a parable, parable about a lost sheep. And he says, just like you money people would search and search and search, you're going to leave the 99 to find that one. Just like you're going you're gonna to leave your $99 to find that $1 to make your $100 back. <laughs> he says, just like you go hard for money, the kingdom goes hard for people. Yes. He says, just like you lose your coin and you're going to search your house and turn everything upside down to find that coin, just like you go hard to find your coin, the kingdom goes hard. The kingdom will turn everything upside down to find people. Yes. One son leaves home. One son's a lost son, right? He's a lost son. When he comes back, daddy don't talk about nothing that he did. Daddy don't talk about the money that he wasted. Daddy is happy that the lost person, the lost son is back because the kingdom always prioritizes people over everything else. When you disciple, make the kingdom agenda your agenda, you'll always be able to draw from Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to be in your word, Father. Thank you so much. For understanding. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for knowledge. Thank you for the seed of your word being planted in fertile ground. We set our minds over stewarding that word, watching it, watching over it, watering it with faith, watering it with action, watering with expectation. By your spirit's leading, we'll study to show ourselves approved unto God. So that the seed that you plant grows and produces harvest. That's our expectation. Thank you, Lord. And we thank you for it. Hallelujah.